Hello, yes, welcome to the global webinar on forensic on public health. I'm Nawaz Sheikh, uh, your host for today. And uh, our first speaker for um, today is Dr. Pranav Shatriya uh, from Symbiosis International University, India. And he's going to give a talk on public health and geographic information system. And I request uh, Dr. Pranav to start his presentation. Yes, sir. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. According to your respective time frame, time zone. Okay. So, in line with the uh, theme of the global webinar of public health, this is the first field that is insight and innovation in public health. Uh, I will be going to talk on the perspective of application of geographic information system in public health. These are the contents which I will be going to cover in my presentation and my presentation will be divided into three portions. The first portion will be of definition of geographic information system. Second will be definition of health geographic information system. Third will be components of geographic information system. Now the second part of my presentation uh, will be started. That is application in public health and the software which can be used of GIS in public health. Then the real world examples of successful application of GIS in public health, the challenges in application of GIS, current scenario of GIS in India, and few works with the use of GIS in public health done by me. Let's start with the first part of the presentation. So what is geographic information system? So geographic information system is a computer based system. Uh, with the help of computer based system, we are collecting number two, editing, number three, integrating, number four, analyzing, and number five, visualizing the spatially referenced data. Now, what is the meaning of spatially referenced data? So any data which is associated with uh, their respective geographical location is known as spatially referenced data. And the end product of this GIS will be spatial dimension of specific geographic areas. Now, what is health geographic information system? So these are the integrated systems, which is having a tool for managing number one, number two, inquiring, number three, analyzing, and number four, presenting the spatially referenced health data. And it, it, it will also help us to understand the dynamics of transmission, that is uh, infectious agent, reservoir, portal of exit, means of transmission, as we all know. And the second, it will help us to understand the spatial determinants of disease at the population level that are the reservoir or vector spatiotemporal dy dynamics, host or pathogen dynamics, human behavior, behavior at the natural community level, uh, habitat of the pathogen ho hosts, etc. And on the landscape level, it will help us to understand the variability such as uh, seasonal variability, exceptional events, and climate change. And at macro level, that is the topmost portion of spatial determinants of health, that is climate, regional environmental con context, and social, economic, and political determinants. Now, there are five components of GIS, uh, which is represented as the edge of the pentagram. I will discuss it one by one. The first is data. So what is data? Data uh, will be collected and stored in a geo database. And the geo database is an information system from which data will be retrieved by the user. The second important component of geographic information system is hardware, which physically stores the data and as well as processing tools. The third important part is software, and it assembles the user interface algorithms by which user access the database, can access the query, and can also analyze the data. The fourth important component of GIS is the algorithm or data management procedures. And the last one that are we, the people, both the producer and as well as consumer of the spatial data. And one of the important fact is that GIS can integrate all the type of data such as imagery or multidimensional or tabular, or it can be 3D or it can be big data, et cetera. Now, before going to the next part of my slide, there are some few terminologies we must, we must understand to understand the example. So, so what is the spatial data? So spatial data is nothing. It, it consists of geographical coordinates that provide information about location, number one. Number two, it also provides information about the dimension of features of Earth and relationship among them. 
then the second one is attribute data and it are, they are the data which are attached with the spatial data and with the help of geo codes country name street name etc now what is raster so raster is an image file format which i will be discussing in further slides which is made up of pixels and where each pixel is assigned a color value either red blue according to the author or the preparing map taker the last one is the vector it is one type of geometric shapes such as line point curves etc now the second part of my presentation will be starting now that is applications of geographic information system in public health so the one of the most important application of gis in public health will be we are we are, we are mapping the disease incidence number one number two prevalence over some geographic area to see the trends and as well as what what is the present situation and application of gis in public health can also help the public health practitioner to plan more cost effective interventions the second important application of gis in public health is to find out the estimation of spatial variation of disease number two determination of risk factor of disease and improved delivery of health services there are many enumerable applications of gis in public health which will be out of my scope of my presentation so i have included only few applications so further applications are map the population who are at risk plan and target the intervention it can be also used to forecast the epidemics then it can also used to locate the nearest health center etc now there are also some extended applications uh, of gis in public health such as it can also be used to diagnose and investigate the health problems and hazards in the community then it can also help to enforce the laws and regulation for sensitization of the government that can protect the health and ensure safety and it can also help to develop policies and plans that support individual and community health effects there are many available softwares which can be used by public health practitioner if he or she want to use geographic information system in public health uh, it is divided into two uh, stratifications such as free gis softwares and commercial softwares in terms of free gis softwares there is epimap which is developed by centers for disease control and prevention in collaboration with who then there is health mapper and geoda geoda da tm and in terms of commercial softwares there are arc views which is paid version we have to buy the license for it to use it and map info now the next part of my presentation will be real world examples of successful application of gis in public health so before going to the real world scenarios used by many public health experts in entire world we must understand a word which is known as spatial interpolation and spatial interpolation is a technique used under gis and it is widely used technique and easiest technique uh, under gis domain so what is spatial interpolation so spatial interpolation is nothing but a just a process of using points with known values to estimate the values at other unknown points for example uh, if we want to make a rainfall map for the country and for example i am living in a state which is known as gujarat and for example purpose i am having only one weather station so i will use from one weather station the points and known values to estimate the values at other unknown points or other unknown places in my state and it will create a raster surface covering will be covering an entire area i will be discussing about what is raster surface and the result of this partial interpolation is a raster layer and it is always important to find out a suitable interpolation method there are many uh, suitable interpolation method and it is not under the scope to explain it today so i will be covering in another lecture okay now the first example of a uh, geographic information system used in public health the first successful example i should say that is geographic analysis machine which was developed in 1987 by sir opanshaw and his colleagues and it was first notable medic medical uh, geographic information system software which uh, to analyze the location of clusters of leukemia in 1983 and with the use of uh, geographic analysis machine opanshaw was also able to demonstrate the clustering effects of leukemia and other cancers so what was the peculiarity of the geographic analysis machine so there was main four major component of the geographic analysis machine and it was time around 1983 to 1987 so there was spatial hypothesis generator number 1 number 2 there was gis to handle the spatial data retrieval request by the user 
Number three, there was significant assessment procedure. And number four, there was geographical display and post map processing system. Now, GIS has also been used under the domain to understand the socio-economic, cultural, and environmental determinants of health. So the, one of the most important example is the poverty map uh, by CDC or by United Nations Development Fund. So what is the importance of poverty map? So poverty map is also an end product of geographic information system. And uh, due to this, the health services will able to identify the priority population, the target population to which the health system resources should be directed. Now, uh, this is an example from the West Africa. Uh, authors have by understanding the spatial aspects of WASH indicators. So WASH, as we all know that it is water, sanitation, and hygiene, have contributed or have uh, developed a role or have identified that there is a significant uh, role of water supply and sanitation in the, in the burden of health means infection in school-going children in West, West Africa. So they have taken a household level data from of three wash indicators, such as there is either absence or presence of toilet. The second indicator which we have, uh, they have chosen was uh, absence or presence of floor. And the third, which is the most important one, that is whether it is a piped water supply is present or absent. And all these data were, were recruited from uh, DHS, that is Demographic and Health Survey. So what is caster cell, as I have already talked before? Caster cells is the different color pattern as you have, as you have seen in the map. And this survey was done in three, uh, three countries of West Africa, that was Mali, Burkina Faso, and Ghana. And as you can see that in Burkina Faso, there was significant absence of toilet uh, in, the, in the household. Then in terms of presence or absence of a floor. So in, in the country Mali, we can see that there was significant absence of floor in the country Mali among the three countries. And in terms of uh, piped water supply absence or presence, uh, uh, nearly every country was having significant absence of the piped water supply. Now here, there is a word they have used that is predicted. So in terms of presence of toilet, they have used a technique which I have already discussed was spatial, uh, spatial interpolation in this slide. So they have used this technique and they have provided three map for predicted toilet absence, predicted floor absence and predicted piped water absence. So this was a breakthrough. I can say a breakthrough conclusion was that, that these three countries were lacking in millennium development goals for water and sanitation. The next, the next example is from Papua New Guinea. Sorry if I am pronouncing it as a wrong. Okay, so here they have investigated the spatial variation of high prevalence of severe malnutrition among two provinces. That was Eastern Highland province and the second is Madang district. And for the, the, the authors have divided this, article, uh, this study into three phases or three stratification. So in first phase, they have done a multi-level household cross-sectional study and around 700 children's nutritional health status were used. In the diagram A, as you can see that there are small, 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 small dots, which is, uh, which is of yellow color. Yeah. So these are the participants which were included in the study. And with the help of this participant and with the help of using spatial interpolation technique, they have provided the map of entire two provinces, that is, uh, Eastern Highland province and Madang province. And these are the red cluster and these are the blue cluster. And they have defined the red cluster cells as a hotspot. That for example, in map A, here there is Madang province and here there is Eastern Highland province. Okay. So in, in terms of stunting, uh, Eastern Highland province was having more burden as compared to the Madang province. In terms of wasting, uh, as you can see that there are more red spots or red cluster cells, which is given a pixel or a unit. And as you can see that it is more in Madang province. So of course the wasting burden is more in Madang province. Same do, uh, with the help of same procedure they have done for underweight, sick child, immunization status and breastfeeding. Okay. So with the help of this pre preliminary study, they have identified district specific risk of high risk area of malnutrition and it was used to describe the spatial features that is associated with high prevalence of stunting and wasting at the two province level and at the district level. And what they have found, so they have also, uh, 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 in the last phase of the study, 
they have calculated age adjusted risk score and they have stratified according to the risk score 1 risk score 2 risk score 3 plus and risk score 4 plus so they have found that they, there was high geographical variability of stunting and wasting in the both targeted region that is both the provinces so uh, there are there are district level differences in the health outcome which is masked due to data aggregation and it can lead to misleading conclusion now the next uh, next example will be of GIS used under disease surveillance and early warning system. So with the help of geospatial technology in Jamaica, uh, they, they were, the state government official was successful in controlling a major outbreak of malaria, which was, uh, from, uh, which was uh, scheduled in 2010 to 2011. But with the help of 2006 to 2009 data and geospatial technique, they have controlled a major outbreak of malaria. So what they have done? So first of all, they have mapped all the year of onset outbreaks and cases on the map and due to this uh, the foci of infection was identified and the targeted intervention uh, which lead to uh, had led to targeted intervention and there was rapid containment of the outbreak so in the next year they have divided the affected area into 23 geographic grid in which eight of which was the affected community as you can see in the map this has also helped the surveillance team to systemic, uh, systematically examine the communities for anopheles breeding sites and uh, due to this they have already identified so they, uh, these sites were subjected to larvicidal treatment or implementation of environmental controls and the concentration or improvement in adulticidal treatment in the affected grid. Now this is one of the most important example and exciting example used uh, which provide uh, information about the use of G importance of GIS what, what is the power of GIS in public health. So this is, uh, there was one rapid epidemiological mapping of oncocerciasis, which is known as REMO in over 20 African countries, which was led by African program for oncocerciasis control, EPOC. And this, this was, this is result of rapid epidemiological mapping in Liberia. And there was total around 20 African countries. And they were also stratified according to the nod nodule prevalence, that is the percentage of subject. For example, zero percentage of subject was having nodule prevalence, one to nine, 10 to 19, and so on. And it's proximity to which river, which river. Okay. So this is a result of rapid epidemiological mapping in Liberia and total 20 African countries were included in it. So uh, the second figure, uh, uh, the second map, which provide information about that the region in which Remo has been completed was categorized according to their need for CD, CDIT. What is CDIT? CDIT is Community Directed Treatment with Ivermectin. So they have divided other region that is 20 African countries in which the remo has been completed. So for example, the red, the red color areas, there, there is a need for definite CDTI that is Community Directed Treatment with Ivermectin. For, uh, another one is possible CDTI area, no CDTI area, etc. Now, this is uh, one of the most important example used by Indian government, that is Tamil Nadu government. So, first of all, it is also divided into three phases. So, first of all, they have taken uh, MF rate, that is microfilariasis rate or microfilariasis data from a selected sample villages from Kudalore, Villupuram, and Thiru Vannamalai district, which is a districts uh, which are districts in Tamil Nadu. And they have mapped using a graduated point symbol as you can see this this is known as graduated point symbol so as the microfilariasis rate increases the diameter of the graduated point symbol will also increase and it will become darker and second in the second phase they have developed a predicted interpolation map with the uh, predicted interpolation i have already uh, explained that what is uh, spatial interpolation so by using this they have uh, made a predicted interpolation map. So if we cancel these points, the background, which is a color shape cluster cells will be our predicted interpolation map. And both the uh, graduated point symbol and as well as predicted interpolation map uh, was combined. And this is the power of GIS. So as you can see that the darker is the color in the predicted interpolation map, the more is the filariasis in that part of Tamil Nadu, which is a state in India. Now, with the help of this uh, graduated uh, point symbol, they have uh, also formulated spatial interpolation for filarial disease and spatial interpolation for filarial infection. In the x-axis, they have placed longitude and in y-axis, they have put latitude. And as you can see that 
the darker is the color that the darker is the purple color the more is the scrotal swelling which was seen in percentage and the more uh, here in second map the darker is the color the more is the filarial infection rate and it also provide uh, it also given con uh, conclusion that uh, it has indicated that filarial disease occurs at the hot spots that these are the region which they have called as hot spot and infection is more diffuse so this uh, this is one of the most important example used by the indian government they have also used gis for using the attribute data as i have already discussed what is an attribute data so uh, this, this is a diagram which a map which provide information that they have done customized mapping of user friendly structured query of spatial data base of filariasis epidemiological information they have also used gis for mapping health monitoring and decision making so as you can see that uh, this is nfd program uh, in the year 2001 which is a very i think that it is over 20 years old date let's okay so they have provided information about the national mass single dose administration program in tamil nadu towards the elimination of filarial disease and they have also uh, shown uh, the importance of gis in mapping the district who were resurveying for filarial detection to be carried out and implementation of the national filaria disease control program the last part of my presentation uh, will be i will be talking about the challenges uh, in application of gis technology which is very goodly noted by stephanie et al ma'am so the first challenges we uh, which uh, she authors have noted that that was there was access to gis infrastructure that was lack of infrastructure and of sophisticated costly gis software the second was uh, under the domain of technical capacity and experience that there was limited or no access to properly trained staff capable of focusing on gis related activities and to follow standardized procedure and the third was uh, the third domain uh, was that data availability and analysis capacity so there was limited av uh, availability of good sp quality spatial data from the ground level privacy confidentiality issues etc and other challenges are there was unskilled workforce lack of policies procedures expensive software expensive hardware as i already talked and uneven data cover now this provide information about the scenario what is the current scenario of gis in india so there was one literature review and analysis and recommendation done by arun kumar sir that is application of gis in public health in india so they have provided information about the number of the papers which have used the geographical tech, uh, geographical uh, information system or geospatial techniques and the number of the paper under which they have used geographical techniques and uh, and sir has it divided into according to the public health domain that there was 64% of the papers which talked about which used the gis in infectious disease criteria then there was uh, seven seven number of papers which have used bacterial and parasitic infection gis so that's all so there are many few more examples which is done by me uh, so i am i am a member of multiple sclerosis society of india so we have done a unique crowd sourced backing of people uh, living with multiple sclerosis and it is currently happening live so let's see Okay, so this is initiated by Multiple Sclerosis Society of India, and they have uh, done an exponentially good work for crowdsourcing mapping of people living with multiple sclerosis. So you can see that this is entire India. As you can see that Maharashtra have six forty three percent living with multiple sclerosis. Madhya Pradesh, which is a state in Central India, uh, having a um, uh, having a person living with multiple sclerosis of around one fifty five. So this this project is currently ongoing. now so recently before 2 to 3 one there was one cholera outbreak in my city so i was recruited by world health organization person a central coordinator that was uh, dr vikas pokre and all the cases of cholera was geotagged and a live map was made by me so let's see it. so majorly three areas were affect, affected which was known as jawan nagar and sai baba nagar so these are all the cases affected with or presumptive cases of cholera 
and these are the leakages which we have found and this was the leakages which we have corrected okay that's all from my side thank you i am open for any questions and i am also open for any discussion thank you thank you dr pranav thank you sir yeah. excellent presentation thank you sir. Okay. moving on our next speaker is dr aru sharma she is from all india institute of ayurveda india and she is going to give a talk on clinical severity of the disease covid 19 the request dr charu sharma to start her presentation thank you so much sir i hope i am audible and visible to all of you yes 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 a very uh, good evening to one and all it may be good morning to many uh, to a few of you so uh, i want to present our work which we conducted last year and that was the time of first wave of covid 19 so uh, there was a very common clinical problem that we were facing in all india institute of ayurveda and it was a basic a clinical observation that uh, the the kinds of patient that we encountered they had the same kind of exposure but at the same time the clinical severity was not uniform in any of those for example if the patients are coming from a common background a common locality a common family at that particular time we could find that uh, that there is no kind of uh, relationship between the exposure and the clinical severity so we so so as to answer this particular question we conducted an observational study Uh, immune state are determined as per principles of ayurveda found associated with clinical outcomes of covid-19 disease results of a cross section pilot study and uh, i had my uh, seniors with me dr shishir kumar mandal dr professor tanuja nesri madam and dr anil kumar who guided us with this research so what i'm going to present in this presentation first of all the background why did you know i'll, I'll be i'll be talking about the research problem after that we are going to talk about the methodology that we particularly uh, adopted for this clinical problem or this research problem and what were the results and what are the points that we need to discuss and what and in the conclusion part i would i would also like to um present the limitation of the study and uh, what are the concluding remarks and other than that how can we incorporate this particular principle to eat to a group of disorders or to a variety of disorders so it was a key it is a key public health priority and it was the emergence of a novel pathogen and we were probing the factors contributing in clinical severity of covid-19 disease and the analysis of this clinical outcome was based on the standardized scales that are being used in contemporary science so we want to explore that what is the common link what is the bridge between the exposure and the clinical severity that that we were encountered that we encountered in the patients who had the same kind of exposure so the, uh, for example if there's a group of individuals who have the same kind of exposure but at this but when we see their uh, you know when we see their outcome the outcome is an, is very different from uh, from in, in one group and the other group so we wanted to see that are there any host factors associated with disease severity can we assess them and how can we uh, modify these host factors so we uh, so in ayurveda we have a uh, we have an entity that is vyadhi shamatva and the note that denotes the host factors and it is a composite score of two kind of entities the modifiable entities and the non modifiable entities is or we say it, like the modify modifiable host factors and the non modifiable host factors so we had a challenge to assess exposure host factor and the clinical outcome at in the same window at the same point of time so for this uh, particular question the the best design that we could have was cross sectional study and the primary objective of the study was to evaluation of the factor 
of the clinical severity along with determining the relationship among these factors. If we are talking about exposure, we are talking about host factor, we are talking about clinical outcome. Is there any relationship between these variables or not? So the secondary objective was to assess the modifiability of their components. If we could modify the host factor, then even if the if, even if a group of individuals has the same exposure, but the clinical outcome will vary because of uh, the host factor. So this was the, the these were the primary objectives that we started with. We adopted a cross-sectional observational study and we conducted this study in the COVID testing center at All India Institute of Ayurveda from August 22, 2020 to September 9, 2020. And uh, we screened and we, we, we developed a questionnaire, we got that validated and we had a CTRI registration for that. And, uh, and, we, and we did this observational study on the diagnosed cases of COVID-19 disease. And the purpose of the questionnaire was to assess these three components in the same in, in, in those individuals at a particular point of time. So after administering this questionnaire, we analyzed the data and we found that the outcome can be presented in many ways. So the one way of presenting the outcome was the assessment of variables in the population. What is the, what is the basic score that we found? So uh, the mean value of exposure score was found to be 17.52. The clinical severity, the mean value of clinical score was found to be 5.3. And Vyadi Shamatu, that is immune status, the mean value for this variable was found to be 14.52. And you see that this factor Vyadi Shamatu has not been assessed in any of the previous studies. So we faced a, you know, a great challenge in, in developing the questionnaire, a questionnaire and then getting it validated. Because uh, so we conducted a pilot study for the for the validation also so that we could have a clear picture in this. And this Vyadi and this entity, Vyadi Shamatu, you know, it is not uh, subjective to the kind of disorders that we are dealing with. Uh, if one individual has a specific uh, score for Vyadi Shamatu, then he or she, they may be prone to, you know, similar kind of disorders and we could appreciate the heterogeneity in these, uh, in, in, in this kind of population. So we found that there was a positive uh, correlation between the exposure factor and the clinical severity factor. Then we found that there was a negative correlation between the exposure and, uh, and the host factor. There was also a negative correlation found between the clinical severity and the host factor. So the first uh, outcome of our study was that we could uh, assess the relationship between these three variables that we um, investigated in the subjects. The second outcome is that we could have an empirical equation of clinical outcome. And we found that clinical severity is directly proportional to the kind of exposure, and it is indirectly proportional to the host factor. So even if you know a, a group of individual have the same kind of exposure, but if we could modify the host factor by the mode of epigenetics, by the mode of uh, by the mode of guidelines that are mentioned in Ayurveda for health, uh, for, for prevention of um, diseases and other kind of guidelines that have been given in Ayurveda and that we usually practice in our hospital also. So we can, uh, you know, we can modify this particular host factor. So what was the other finding that uh, we saw? We saw that we could divide the population into two kind of, uh, you know, two kind of, uh, um, we could stratify them basically. So the stratification was based on the clinical outcome on one end and, and, we all, and when we stratified these uh, groups of population, then we also found that the host factor in those cases where the host factor was less than the median value for that particular population, the clinical outcome was severe. But uh, in the cases when host factor 
was uh, more than or even if it is equal to the median value then uh, you know in, in in those cases we had a better clinical outcome that the, the severity was less and though the exposure you know we we uh, we had that value in in, in which we saw that uh, all the uh, all the subjects that were included in the study initially on the baseline characteristic characteristics they had as uh, you know they, uh, the, the the kind of exposure that they had was uh, was not very significantly different from each other so other than that uh, now the novel uh, thing that we uh, we investigated in this study was vyadi shamatva or we call it immune status as per guidelines of ayurveda so basically it is a composite score that is based on the incompatible items that uh, that um, that uh, that a particular individual uh, intakes it is a you know it is also it is also it, it also includes the strong the kind of metabolism that he or she has it depends on the age factor it depends on the physical exercise factor it depends on the dietary patterns that he or she follows and it also depends on the strength or the bala factor that we had and even you know if if you see this kind of score we can actually identify that there there are some factors that are modifiable and there are some factors that cannot be modifiable for example if you're talking about strength or bala so there are three four classification of strength according to ayurveda in which only one of you know one of the classification it, it is modifiable other than that it is not in the same way if you're talking about lifestyle uh, modifications they come into the modifiable factors the dietary patterns the you know the incapacity compatible dietary behavior that also comes into the modifying uh, the host response uh, age is not a, a, not a modifiable factor so base in this composite score we found that 90% of the entities that we we had a sub component the sub items included in the questionnaire that these are the factors that can be modifiable and they could be uh, and they could be executed or they could be uh you know that uh, that could be a possibility that we could modify the host response and then that will further modify the clinical severity so this was uh, the third outcome that we had now let's talk about the modulation of host response and the possible role of epigenetics researchers have identified epigenetic mechanism as the silent modulator of host defenses epigenetics can be identified as a dynamic relationship between the environment and the gene expression and when we are talking about the cellular immune response to covid-19 so it is you know in this study we evaluated that the role of the role the role in control and the progression of disease and this you know when we are talking about the host factor it is just not pertaining to a particular kind of classification of uh, infectious disease you know this is a big umbrella this is a this is a basic um, entity you know that has its role even in the even in many metabolic disorders that has its role in different kind of carcinomas and that has been taken as you know as as a, as a sub study in many of the clinical trials conducted but uh, you know it till now th there has been no study which uh, specifically uh, focused on uh, this particular domain of uh, host mechanism and these approaches can accelerate the development of immune therapies and therapeutics as well as preventive care so this is just a brief uh, you know uh, description that i uh, th so this was a brief out uh, i know outline uh, that uh, that i gave you all and uh, basically you know when when we are discussing something when we are into a scientific uh, you know we, when we have that kind of scientific rigor i don't want it to be a monologue kind of thing but i you know i would have really appreciate if we could discuss a few points on it and even we can you know take it to a further level so that how can we incorporate this concept to different kinds of you know group of disorders so the limitation of this particular study was that this was a pilot study and it was done with an objective of assessment of the role of host factor risk responsible in progression of disease we did not uh, you know we did not assess the role of uh, the factor responsible in onset of disease so there are two kinds of mechanism that we could follow that there could be you know this factor could also be responsible for onset of a disease and this factor could also be responsible for progression of a disease so we only assess the progression stage of the disease we did not assess 
the onset stage of disease. And we are further, we have taken up uh, this another trial that is being uh, conducted, you know, that is, uh, that we are working on this. Uh, we, we propose that we could have case control studies that can be done in the uh, future. So we had, you know, we, we could assess its role in the onset of a disease. And this terminology, a disease, it, it you know, it, it is, it refers to different kinds of disorders that we encounter. And another challenge that we particularly faced in our research that, you know, the most of the time was, uh, was dedicated to developing the questionnaire. And uh, uh, we need to have, you know, we need to develop, we need to standardize some kind of objective tools so that we could measure the variables properly. Because even if you're talking about the exposure factor, you know, the, the kind of uh, this exposure factor has been explored in many of the studies, but still it is just the objective, you know, the subjective tools have been uh, always taken up and, uh, and, and, it goes on in the same way the clinical severity was based on the grading and uh, when we are talking about vyadi shamatva and immune status then uh, we need to you know upgrade our tools on objective level so that we can have you know a more precise and we could go for a you know a better design and and we can explore uh, the uh, the variable as well so I would like to conclude here that in this observational studies, Vyadhi Shamatwa immune status, that is a novel variable that we explored in the study, was found to be a determinant of clinical outcome in the diagnosed cases of COVID-19. We uh, found an inverse association between the clinical severity and immune status. This host factor is a multivariate function of modifiable and non-modifiable attributes. The varying host responses can be considered for the development of clinical guidelines in the prevention and management of illness because the various kind of host responses and even you know this is this is a this is a matter of uh, exploration further that when we are talking about geographical distributions we are talking about such concepts like prakriti that is the ayurveda constitution that has been explored in many of the studies so it has been found that you know the the, the host responses may vary but we still need to uh, we, we need to come up to a level so that we can define we can stratify the pollution the, the population based on the kind of host response or the kind of host behavior and this is basically considered that this can be considered further for the development of clinical guidelines in the prevention and management of COVID-19 illness and not just this kind of infectious disease but we can extend that to many kind of chronic illness as well. So this was an epidemiological research to investigate the relationship and we could extract, you know, we could explore that relationship, but still we need to understand the mechanism of immune responses in terms of, in, in terms of, in terms of multiple variables that, and uh, when we talk about the science of Ayurveda, there are basic fundamentals that clinicians practice all over the globe, but these fundamentals, they need to be um, you know, they, they need to have a practical guideline, they need to be developed, they need to be seen on to those, into those practical guidelines which can accelerate the development of immune therapies and uh, and as uh, hmm, as mentioned uh, the kind of uh, the, the stratification of population so we can have this stratification and then we can further um, uh, the, the, then we can further formulate the guidelines based on this kind of stratification and this is uh, and, and and this is our article that has been uh, that that is in pre-proof uh, in the journal of ayurveda and integrative medicine uh, published by elsevier and uh, this may and uh, and if, if any one of you is interested please uh, you know go through this title and then you'll find the pre-proof that is present uh, you know that that the journal has already uh, uploaded in their in the website so uh, if any of you uh, has any questions then please you know i don't want to be this uh, monologue kind of thing let there be discussion let there be queries and and then only we can you know we can uh, we can actually um, quench better and go further thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity and you know this is open for discussion now thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary Sharma. That was a really great presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Raksha Adhikari. She is uh, president and co-founder of Ecosys Nepal. 
and she is going to give a talk on maternal and child health situation in Nepal. And I request uh, Raksha to start her presentation. Just a second, I will be sharing my screen. Uh, I think it's now visible. Yes, yes, yes it's visible. Okay. So at first, like uh, a warm good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone present here today. Uh, at first, I really want to thank uh, Mr. Siv Siva Prasad for giving me this opportunity to share my views and, you know, like my experience um, on this topic. Uh, introducing myself, I'm, uh, I'm a public health undergraduate and currently a president of Ecosyst. It is an organization promoting sustainable environment. Uh, we have been conducting sessions, uh, environment, re environment related uh, sessions uh, on like uh, waste segregation, uh, or solid waste management and other many more. But for today, I'll be speaking on maternal and child health situation here in Nepal. So I want to start it. So as we all know, mothers and children are categorized as vulnerable group of population of like of any population. They comprises about 71.4% of population of the developing countries. In Nepal only, women of childbearing age, which is from 15 to 49 years, constitute of 22.2% of the population and the children under 15, 15 years of age uh, are about 35.3% of the total population. Altogether, they are of uh, about 57.5% of the whole population. While, uh, you know, motherhood is uh, often taken as positive and fulfilling experience by women. Uh, for, but for many women, it can be associated, associated with suffering, uh, uh, suffering and even death. Uh, now talking about the situation here in Nepal, uh, the main direct causes of maternal morbidity and mortality are taken to be obstructed labor, hemorrhage infections and maternal hyper, hypertensions. The three delays of critical importance of the outcomes of obstetric emergency in Nepal's context are delay in seeking care, delay in reaching care, and delay in receiving care. The three major strategies adopted by government of Nepal to overcome those challenges are promoting broad preparedness and public complication readiness, including awareness rising and improving the availability of funds, transportation for its geographical terrain, and also the blood supplies. Encouraging for institutional uh, delivery, because uh, you know, uh, still in many parts of Nepal, uh, people are like really shy and uh, not that much aware to visit our proper medical institution for delivery services. So they uh, like request their relatives or known person for the uh, delivery, but government is like, because it is risky also. So our government is encouraging them for institutional delivery. The expansion of 24 hour emergency obstructive care services at selected public health facilities in every district, which is about 75 districts uh, in the whole Nepal. This is the situation of maternal health uh, in SAC countries, uh, 2017. Over here, we can see that Afghanistan has uh, the highest number of maternal deaths, which, which is 638 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And uh, Sri Lanka is the least one with only 36 maternal uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. Now, the Safe Motherhood Initiative in Nepal. It was initiated in 1997, AD here in Nepal, and it is, its main and like foremost goal is to reduce maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality, and to improve the maternal and neonatal health by addressing uh, avoidable factors that can cause uh, death during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period. Uh, no. over, here, over here, you can see the elements of safe motherhood. And there is the data of two of the 
fiscal years back to back. Uh, uh, over, uh, from this data, we can see that there has been a um, little bit improvement than the other like previous years. And it is, uh, it is nice to have a little bit also like, you know, uh, kind of a difference than having no improvements at all. So it is really nice that even now people has like increased the institutional deliveries and even the PNC visits and ANC visits has increased in certain numbers. Programs of Safe Motherhood in Nepal has three main uh, programs running in Nepal uh, under each. Well, the first one is birth, pre birth preparedness package, which includes ANC, PNC services, uh, essential newborn care, identification uh, of the danger signs during pregnancy, delivery postpartum, and newborn uh, babies. Uh, uh, it is like uh, it is like one of the package, you know. It is like really important, and it consists of most of the essential need that a mother need at the time of her pregnancy, and with uh, also the danger signs can be addressed early so that it can help in reducing the uh, live births or steel births or uh, uh, like. Uh, sorry, like uh, any complications in babies. Uh, and the second program is rural ultrasound program. And the third one and foremost is the uh, foremost important is AMA, which is uh, translated to be mother in Nepali and newborn program. In this program, the government has, uh, go government, give, uh, government is giving incentive to the mothers for uh, their, for the, transportation to institution delivery or incentive for their you know, complete four mandatory NC visits and uh, some like uh, free institution delivery service and so on, which has like really helped encourage mothers to follow the real protocol and safe protocols of safe motherhood. Now moving towards the child health situation in Nepal. National Immunization Program, NIIP, is one of the successful public health programs of Ministry of Health and Population and has achieved several milestones contributing to reduction in child morbidity and mortality uh, with vaccine preventable diseases. In fiscal year 2020-2021, uh, Nepal has become one of the few countries to complete its, complete its nationwide vaccination campaign, though uh, during the during the whole this pandemic thing going on, it has like it uh, hold it like it organized camp campaigns like camps in different parts uh, of the country so that it, uh, it will be safe for them to for babies to be immunized and their routine of immunization won't be like that uh, uh, disturbed during this pandemic. The integrated package of child survival inter intervention addresses the main problems of new sick born babies, such as bacterial infections, jaundice, hypothermia, and low birth weight. It also maintain, maintains its aim to address major childhood illness like pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and malnutrition among five years, uh, under five, year, uh, five years children in a holistic way. Uh, in fiscal year 2020-2021, a uh, total of the total of newborn cases were registered and treated health uh, treated in health institution is higher uh, in comparison to the previous fiscal year, and which is a really great sign for child health situation. Uh, child health uh, child is particular particularly vulnerable because. As I already said before, they are they belong in a uh, belong to vulnerable one of the vulnerable uh, population, so they tend to suffer from uh, malnutrition and diabetes easily. And uh, one of the reason for that is also because of the mother's health. And uh, in the fiscal year 20, again with the data, the percentage of new born with low birth weight, which is below 2.5 kg of a standard uh, uh, weight, was 13 percent. Issues and challenges faced for maternal and child health. Okay, so these are the challenges and issues faced by especially mothers uh, in Nepal. So uh, 
why like what are the challenges so it, uh, the challenges at first is lack of awareness about the maternal health services as we discussed before like there has been numerous health uh, services give, uh, provided by government but women themselves are not that much aware about it uh, and because of that the utilization of maternal health services has decreased and has hampered so much uh, because there is and uh, there is uh, the service available but if it is not being utilized then there is no use of it so uh, these are uh, okay this uh, these are also the problems and then there is social uh, disparities in maternal health like uh, still in nepal like there is so much inequality and there are so much taboos going on uh, women's health are uh, like taken as a neglected subject and in comparison to men because the men are taken as a breadwinner of the family, so they are given more care in compare in uh, in area of uh, nutrition or health services or anything. They are given the priority. If uh, women are suffering, then they are they are, they are taught to be strong enough. They are taught to be like you know live in that way only. So these kind of norms are affecting the maternal health so much. They they are not given that uh, permission because here women should be permitted. So they are not that much permit, uh, given permission to go and seek medical care and exercise their rights on it. Um, and yeah, those are the social disparities. And of course, there is a low social economic status of, of women because of illiteracy, still, and inequality. Uh, women are taken to be somebody who should be bounded at, inside the home and they should be like, you know, doing the household chores, like cleaning, cooking and everything. And due to, due to which they are not allowed to go out of the house and work for them to earn some amount of some money. So because of that, they, they don't have that much of say. So in many communities, so that is also one of the problem. And, uh, in uh, still here, there it has been seen that the culture of eloping in many communities is kind of a tradition. They prefer uh, eloping at early age, teen age, than getting married at the right age. Though the legal age uh, given by the government is twenty years for uh, legal age given for marriage is twenty years, but still uh, many girls and boys they tend to elope uh, early than their age and even uh, it is hid by the community because in the name of uh, norms and traditions, it is still being practiced in many places though government is trying really hard to abolish them, but still going on. So it is also the result of result of early marriage. Uh, at the time when they are not that much known about the body, they have to be, you know, like they have to be uh, responsible, for, responsible for the baby they are carrying which is nearly impossible because they themselves at this, as their age being pregnant can lead to malnutrition, which, uh, which can be transferred to baby also. And later on, it can result to permanent disabilities and uh, or even death at many cases. And the vicious cycle continues. And like I already said, the superstitious and indigenous practice uh, in many communities still they are, they believe on witch doctors and witchcraft so much, like, or the taboos of, you know, like following some culture or religion. It's not bad to follow or follow some traditions or religion, but being, uh, you know, being dead in your head and like following them uh, without any perception is really bad and can lead to, lead to nowhere. So, Still, people people believe in those kind of things than actually going uh, going to health uh, institution and getting checked. So these are the issues and challenges mostly faced by the maternal and uh, maternal and child health. Like these are the uh, issues impact uh, causes impacting the maternal and child health of here, like people of here. So in conclusion. In the context of Nepal, maternal mortality remains one of the biggest health problems in the public health problems in Nepal. Lack of access to basic maternal health care, diffi uh, difficult geographical terrain, 
developed underdeveloped transportation and communication systems, illiteracy, illiteracy women's status in the society, political conflict and shortage of healthcare professionals, and also the under utilization of currently available services are the major health challenges of maternal health in Nepal. In order to bring out real improvements in this, uh, all these uh, challenges, uh, there should be like more attention. <laughs> So more, the more attention should be given to the medical and also the social in interventions because they has to be uh, aligned because they are however, however interrelated. Uh, if there is like improvement in medical services, but the social taboos and uh, like cultural thing is still there. And if it is pulling out, then uh, even if there is medical uh, facilities, it won't be utilized. So they have to go hand in hand and work in that way. Improving health facilities, uh, mother's nutrition, women's portion in uh, society uh, has taken as free, uh, freedom of movement, providing education to female children, uh, uh, tra avoiding traditional birth attendance into local health services can play a vital role. Like I said, like, now still the mother the women of the society like in most of the community are doesn't have say or have much of a say even if they if it cons, uh, cons uh, even if it concerns their health so they should be like more given power like at least not that much higher power but at least they should be able to talk about their rights at least know about their rights and be uh, able to exercise it well and uh, the nutrition is really important. If they, they are much aware about it, then of course the nutrition will be improved, their state will be improved, and their, eventually their health will be improved, resulting to uh, improvement of the child's health. The interventions uh, should aim to uh, improve maternal health, should um, improving maternal health should be focused on uh, providing like power, making power, uh, making power of women, their education status and family income. Like I already said, the hundred and hundred, they are not that much educated. Uh, they won't have, they won't know about it and they won't be able to say anything and or stand up for themselves or for others, uh, which, will, which will create such a backward community. So first we need to promote education and then uh, health comes with it. And of course, if they are about, about uh, able to work, then of course their family income will also be improved. Similarly, in order to improve service utilization regarding maternal health, involvement of male partners or family should be encouraged. Uh, always when we talk about maternal health, it is about women, but what about the men of the family? Because uh, they, are, uh, they are in this together. Like, uh, it is not the it is not the job just the job of the women part of the family to improve a, a family or create a safe environment, but also uh, the male part of the family because they should have they should have like given the chance to be in this together at first and then they should be aware together. If that happens, then then they uh, they can join hands and together they can work for it. Then one fighting and then one discouraging because. If uh, uh, we only educate women, then uh, they will go like speaking for their rights and everything. But what about the male? They, they will be like, still they, they, they're gonna suppress it. And one way or another, again, the boys will be suppressed. So if we take them together and give them knowledge about it and what kind of uh, effect it has, uh, if, we can, if, we, if we will be able to show them, then I guess like it will be uh, a win-win situation at that time. Now way forward, like what should we do for the improvement of all these problems that we have discussed? At first, improving health service utilization, like like I said, like uh, uh, like making a big hospital or making all the service available doesn't make uh, doesn't make any difference if we are not utilizing it. Like for example, there is a food, uh, there is a plate of food and uh, like healthy food, but if we are not eating it, then what is the use of that food that has been kept there? 
that, that doesn't make any difference. So we have to uh, like work on it, like how we can indulge the, this population to use the uh, use their rights and the services they they which is made for them only. So and again, involving male in maternal health it is really important. Like if we work on this together, then of course there will be difference that will be seen easily. And making service affordable. Making availability only doesn't make a difference because we are, we are from developing country. So uh, if, uh, especially in, for example, I wanna take is in the situation of COVID-19, uh, uh, like people are dying out of hunger and because they are uh, running, off, uh, running out of their employment. So, uh, uh, at that situation, if we like, if even if they are dying, if we give them like food, a uh, choice between food and a health service, they will obviously choose food because they're hungry and that's their basic need. Then the health service that we are giving, uh, which they can't afford also. So, if we make it affordable, then they can, you know, like do it together. Then they will, of course, eat their food also and choose their health institution facilities also. So we have availability only doesn't help. It has to be access. Uh, it has to be like, uh, it has to be given proper access and also it has to be affordable for them to really enjoy those facilities and empowering women in the society. Like it is really important, uh, uh, like knowing, uh, giving them equal chances, giving them equal opportunities, it can help women, women whose, whose voices has been suppressed can be, uh, can at least talk about their rights and know about the health, uh, the ha like health situation they are in and work on it. So we need to empower women in the society and promoting education. Education is key to literally everything, uh, developed nation or everything. So. Until and unless we don't give them proper illiter like literacy thing or like proper education, they won't, uh, even if we speak a lot, if we conduct awareness campaigns or anything, it won't make any difference. So at first we need to educate them. Maybe not like higher education or something, but we can educate them about the uh, ongoing situation and their rights and everything. These are the references of uh, the journals and uh, annual reports I have used for this presentation. Now coming into the presentation. Asli, thank you and namaste. Uh, and if, if you have any questions, then of course we can speak up, uh, we can talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentation. It was a great talk. Yes. Russia, thanks. <clears throat> Russia, thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. I have just um, one question. So, in some in some countries, there is a use of uh, community based attendance. These are community members who are being trained um, on delivering the um, delivering. So, I don't know if um, in Nepal we have this community based attendance that help women, especially in rural areas where um, the access to health center uh, is not, it's not really, most of the time it's not possible. So I don't know if there, you people have this community-based attendance. Okay, so in Nepal, we have uh, this uh, family, uh, sorry, uh, female community health workers. They are called FCHPs. Uh, they uh, they are like uh, they are com uh, community based uh, like workers and of course yeah they help in this uh, delivery and everything but uh, as we have uh, I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to show the data data over here but yeah uh, but there is this thing like you know still they are not being able to use uh, like proper um, you know like proper devices or instruments I would like to say for the proper delivery of a baby so uh, they even they also they are uh, all these nine months they take care of the pregnant women of a uh, pregnant woman of a community but during delivery or the delivery time they suggest 
them to go to the proper institution, which is available in every community. There's help post, help post and everything built in every community. So, but still women are not being able to go there. They prefer being delivered by their near, uh, their known uh, like relatives or you know some people they know than uh, the medical uh, workers. Uh, yeah, some uh, than medical workers. But yeah, FGSPs, as I said, female community health workers, they are still trying to you know aware the women's on it. So yeah, that's all. Uh, any more questions? I, I hope I have like okay, uh, answered the question. If not, like we can talk. Uh, is your question answered? Uh, any other questions? Our no. next speaker no. is uh, Dr. Mohammad Karim. He is a uh, public mm -hmm. clinical expert from Afghanistan. And I request uh, Dr. Karim to start his presentation. All right. So I have to find my files. Okay. So, first of all, uh, warm gratitude to all of you, especially our host, Nawaz Shaikh and uh, Shiva, and all other participants from around the globe in today's Global Scientific Guild Public Health Conference. So my topic is about assessment of the availability and utilization of RMNCH, a reproductive maternal neonatal, child and adolescent health and ATM, uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria in the targeted communities of whose province prior to service delivery by FHS or family health houses. Uh, before going to contents, uh, I have to uh, briefly introduce about the host province, uh, about this uh, um, presentation topic, which is especially about uh, family health houses or private health providers in a rural community of host province related to uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border. So the contents are First of all, I have to tell you about the background, uh, rationale of the study and research questions which are being asked from community members uh, and overview of methods in which study design, study setting, sampling te technique and study participants were involved, eligibility criteria for the participants and data collection methods for data collectors, data, collect data collection procedure, and data analysis and ethical considerations. And after that, study trustworthiness and expected outcome of the research. Shaikh, am I audible to all of you? Yes, yes, please continue. All right. Yes, you are, I hear you. Okay. So the background of this study, especially which is quality, qualitative based uh, study, as I mentioned to you, that the assessment of RMNCH and ATM health services in the targeted communities of post province remote uh, rural areas, which are white uh, according to health uh, survey, having already established seven FHHs or family health houses and two private health providers or clinics prior to service delivery points. Uh, before going to detail, uh, some brief about host province, as I mentioned earlier, which is located near to Pakistan and Afghanistan border. The province is dominated by the host valley and the mountains that surround it, as you can see in this picture, which is one of the district, Jaji Maidan. Uh, so rangelands run from Gurbaz district in the south to Jaji Maidan district in the north. Host Valley and Buck area sustain rain path and intensively irrigated crops. Natural forests run along the border with Pakistan and Pakhtia. Uh, why we selected 
these areas because according to Ministry of Public Health uh, Demographic Health Survey, uh, most of the areas which are still white mean there are no health services, access to rural communities or local communities. So uh, seven FHHs by the Fund of UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and with the technical assistance of Ministry of Public Health of Afghanistan, established and two already established private clinics were being run by local community members there. So uh, this kind of research study in its nature is very rare in Afghanistan scenario as one was being done here in Khost and the second one is in Badakhshan province at the same time. So rationale of the study, what is rationale in qualitative research? As I mentioned earlier that my study was qualitative totally. So the research is the reason for conducting the study. The rationale should answer the need for conducting the said research in the community, it's a very vital or important part of publication as it justifies the significance and innovation of the study. That's why it's also referred to as the validation of the study. Uh, my, res uh, my research study rationale was included household assessment or survey in which individual questionnaire with mothers having child over five years old were being done, key informant interviews from uh, NGO as well as uh, public health uh, members were being done, focus group discussions in communities and family health action groups were being done. What kind of research questions were being asked uh, by keeping all these members in scenario? So phenomenological research questions. Uh, first of all, you have to know about the phenomenology is a form of qualitative research that focuses on the study of an individual's life experiences. Not, we have to say in a story linked, uh, you know, excuse has sometime being mentioned uh, within the world, also it's a powerful approach for inquiry, a question. The nature of this methodology is often threatening to health profession education researchers who are being involved in such kind of research study. So as a health professional, I personally involved myself in the field along with my six data collectors. All of them were MD doctors for collecting the real data from communities in a random way, house to house to lead to our studies, goals, or approach. What was the overview of methods which we being used in our study? The study design was totally population-based assessment and the study setting was baseline evaluation, sampling technique and study participants, random sampling, and our participants were being involved, uh, childbearing age women, uh, CBAW, and pregnant women, PW, 20 to 25 years age. The eligibility criteria for our key informant interviews and focus group discussions from community plus PPAD or NGO members, as I mentioned you earlier. The data collection methods, random data collection from house to house in which uh, houses were being selected and then our data collectors uh, go there, went there to collect the real data to discuss with local community members, especially females at homes. Data collection procedure as per questionnaire, face-to-face, -face, one by one interview and data analysis, key IIs, key informant interviews and FGDs, FGDs via audio clip transcription, uh, which I did myself, uh, and ethical considerations were being kept in mind by safe deletion of audio clips after transcribing by keeping confidentiality of participants involved in our study. 
And what was the study trustworthiness? Uh, during my research, along with my data collectors, all four key components of qualitative research like credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability of the field data was checked at the field as well as at office by external monitors, by MOPH and internal monitors from organization of MOPH donor or implementing NGO of the project. So what was the expected outcome of the research? After finishing our research study, uh, confirmation of the set data, the seven FHHs and two PHPs in the set province started their services for the com poor community of remote or white areas for RMNCH and ATM targeted services in host province. Uh, but before finishing, I have to uh, mention you that this study was totally a comparison between uh, family health houses and private health providers or private clinics. Uh, as before this, uh, Raksha Adhikari mentioned in her own slides, uh, mother and child uh, you know, program she's working on in Nepal. Uh, this study is very related to that one. Why? Because we collected data from females at houses by one of our data collectors. Uh, and 99 questions were involved in our question paper, a questionnaire, sorry, uh, in which different aspects of uh, basic health services like uh, you have to say ANC, PNC uh, and uh, delivery because at FHH only one female midwife is working. Uh, this is the scenario of an FHH while in private clinic you, you, you are knowing well that uh, an MD doctor, midwife, nurse and all other related staff structure is present. So comparatively in a rural area or in a remote area when, where there is no access of local community to all type of health services, essential health services, as I mentioned. Uh, so FHH is comparatively better than those private health providers where people uh, can't pay that amount to get the real health services from opposite side. But in FHH, when midwife, uh, which is working at their own site in a rural community, 24 by seven, uh, can provide better services, all basic services, better to local community. Those communities which are very poor, can't access and can't pay. Uh, so comparatively, this FHH is better than private health providers. But in some settings, private health providers is better than FHH where people can pay more to health services as compared to other one. So this was my, uh, these are my total slides. So thank you to all of you, listen to me and heard the own ears to my voice. Over to you, uh, Shaikh, are you there? Shaikh, am I audible? Hello. Nawaz Shaikh, am I? Yes, able? yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Dr. Kareem. Okay. Welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Kim Burgettini. Uh, she's from Smart LEVR Healthcare Simulations founder and CEO from United States. And she's going to give a talk on technology and the future of nursing. And I request uh, Kim Vergettini to start her presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yes, um, that, that uh, introduction is accurate. So my name is Kim Vergettini, and I'm the founder of Smartly, uh, which is an augmented and virtual reality technology company, specifically with uh, the end purpose of providing medical and nursing uh, trainings in the VR environment. We are a new startup company, so you probably haven't heard of us before, but hopefully you're gonna be hearing a lot more um, about us in the near future. Um, and so we've sponsored this talk because we recognize that there's a need out there for people to understand the technology that is about to enter our world of 
nursing and um, healthcare in general. So I've prepared a little bit of a presentation for you. I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen. All right. And just confirm for me that you can see that all right? Yes, 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 it's all right. Please. All right, so just so you know a little bit about me, um, you know, I started my career as a nurse. Uh, I worked for Cleveland Clinic for the majority of my career, uh, 22 years in total, 17 years at the Cleveland Clinic in the main campus, Ohio, uh, in various roles, working both in medical surgical, ICU, and the perioperative areas. And then uh, I eventually came out to Abu Dhabi, to the UAE, to be part of a startup hospital, which was Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Um, I am currently broadcasting from Abu Dhabi at the moment, even though we are a US-based company, uh, just so you know that the timing is a little bit different here. Um, so while I was working there, I came to um, have some experiences with uh, virtual reality and mixed reality. And it gave me some ideas of how we could use this for um, teaching nurses and teaching doctors. So I left the Cleveland Clinic um, to form smartly, and I myself became a developer. So I have both a nursing background, and I'm also uh, now have a few certifications in the in XR development as well. Uh, plus, I have a team that works for me as well. So, what are XR technologies? I want to touch on this point because even though this seems like very sidelined to um, our tech, our uh, particular discipline, th this term is gonna be thrown around a lot. And so I want you to really have a clear understanding of what it means. So when you see the term XR technologies, that X is really just a placeholder, if you will, for inserting other types of, of technologies or words. So it's an umbrella term. So for example, you could put in there VR, which is, stands for virtual reality. Virtual reality is a fully immersive headset type of experience. Um, you may know of the Oculus Quest, or you may have kids that have a PlayStation uh, virtual reality experience, or you may, may go to the malls and see um, virtual reality experiences because all of this has originated from the gaming world first. Um, industries are just um, adapting that technology for their own training purposes, but it has started out with the gaming world. Um, the next one on the list there is AR or augmented reality. So what is this? Um, well, you may have seen examples on your own phone. Uh, you can download apps these days that um, if you, you know, if you played the game Pokemon, um, I think it was called Pokemon Go, where you, people would walk around town and then they would, if they came to a certain area of town, they would find a Pokemon there. Um, so augmented reality is taking something from the camera and augmenting it by putting labels or information on the screen or perhaps an object into the, that environment um, and augmenting it. Whereas the difference is virtual reality is completely 100% artificial. Now you also will hear the term mixed reality. So what is that? If you um, get an experience with Microsoft HoloLens and I highly recommend it, um, they are using something that's a little bit between virtual reality and a little bit more, so it's not quite uh, virtual reality in that it doesn't, um, you know, give you an entirely artificial experience, but it's more than augmented reality because uh, you're able to put objects, uh, by wearing their headset, you put objects into the environment and you can also manipulate them. So that makes it a little bit different from just augmented reality. It's augmented reality with the added spin that you can interact with the objects that you have put into the environment. So as I said, um, virtual reality refers to head-mounted displays or HDMs or um, other brands are, uh, brands. some of the popular brands out there are the one on the top there is the HTC Vive, the one on the bottom is the Oculus Rift. Now I do not have any stock in these companies so I'm not 
promoting them for any other particular purposes than to show you that there are a variety of headsets that are on the market, probably at least 20 or so headsets. And I expect that there will be many more to come. These headsets, um, when they're in use, have a variety of arrangements. Some of them um, need sensors on the side to pick up what is going on in the environment. Some of them use hand controllers. And some of the more advanced ones that you will be seeing coming out in uh, later this year and next year may not even need anything more than just the headset itself. They will have hand detection. So this is an example of the Sony PlayStation. So many of you, whether you may not have experienced VR yourselves, you may, you may have seen kids or you may have uh, your own kids or maybe out in the mall will uh, have experienced um, games that they can play using those types of headsets. So how does that relate to nursing, the world of nursing? Well, early last year, at the very beginning of the pandemic, the um, World Health Organization put out a report, the first of its kind that the World Health Organization had ever done. And that was um, the State of the World's Nursing 2020. And this was the largest study on the condition of nursing done uh, to date. What that, the summary of what that was a 144 page report, it's free to read. You can go to the World Health Organization um, website and download it for free. But the summary of it is that basically the world does not have enough nurses commensurate with the sustainable development uh, goal targets. And that by 2030, in 10 years from now, there is projected to be a 5.7 million nurse shortage um, and 18 million healthcare worker shortage. Um, and all of these numbers were calculated at the very beginning of the pandemic. So imagine how they might have even changed a little bit uh, as the pandemic has gone on. So there is a need to invest in massive acceleration of nursing education and, educa and um, educational infrastructure urgently to address um, our global needs. Even in the US, and again, uh, the statistics unfortunately were taken pre-COVID because they're not available yet uh, post-COVID, but um, they showed that the growth for nursing in the US alone is going to be one of the fastest growing professions there is um, aside from software. So 15% per year from 2020 to 2030, and that's triple the average growth of other professions. If we don't prepare now, what we've seen with COVID, it's going to be 10 times worse in 2030 if we do not have the, the numbers needed, nurses, healthcare workers in general, to manage any kind of um, um, global pandemic or other type of world event. Um, so, we need to prepare. And that is why the time is now for XR types of technologies. So there's an increased need for distance learning options for medical professionals. Uh, imagine that many of the schools of nursing and also the medical schools were not able to put in their clinical hours for the last years of their students because of COVID restrictions. Um, in the hospitals. So you need an alternative for how you're gonna train those nurses if you can't get them proper clinical experiences. Uh, the other thing is Moore's Law, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, we can actually move on to that. Uh, so the other thing is that we need to, we need to advance uh, medical and nursing education in a more cost-effective way as well to handle this demand. So what is Moore's law? Moore's law is basically a rule of thumb that says that in the world of technology, uh, computing power doubles itself every two years. And so this has led to an upward slope of advancement in technology where we have an exponential growth. So it's growth in the beginning was rather slow. Uh, the development of computers in the 1970s and the 1980s, and even the early 1990s was really rather slow. But now we're reaching this point where the, because of the exponential factor at work with doubling computing power every year, 
our technology advancement is going to get faster and faster and faster. Only now have we managed to reach the time where these technologies have matured in their own uh, right. And now uh, we are getting seeing the benefit of not just having technologies that are mature in their own right, but converging with other types of technologies to bring an either, even greater um, usefulness to them. So an example of that, for example, is Tesla. No, I'm not paid by Tesla. Don't worry, it's not an advertisement for them. But here we have the technology of an electric car paired with AI-driven self-driving. So two technologies that are converging now to um, form a much more advanced product than either one of those things independently are. So how does that relate to the medical profession or healthcare profession? Well, we are seeing huge advancements in artificial intelligence being used to help um, doctors uh, come up with diagnoses. Um, we are seeing some work with robotics happening. And you know, it may be very well that by the, 20, the year 2030 or 2040, you might go to see your doctor and you might actually um, be faced with a humanoid type of robot uh, that speaks and interacts with you as a human. Uh, we may have different opinion, differing opinions, um, all of us about what that should look like or whether that should even exist, but we cannot avoid that this technology is coming and is going to manifest itself in some way or other in our profession. Already you can see that there are some um, um, uses out there. Uh, some hospitals have employed robots that are able to get supplies for nurses and offset the demand for healthcare um, assistance. Um, AI in medicine right now is already being used in some facilities uh, to perform library searches more efficiently than a human could do it also to crowdsource data to um, come up with diagnoses, especially for rare diseases that are often difficult to diagnose. The benefit of artificial intelligence is that they don't have a bias towards the information. And they're extremely good at pattern identification and data analysis. IBM Watson is um, uh, one of the devices that you may be one of the artificial intelligence programs that we might have heard of. Originally, uh, I think we all heard about it with um, uh, playing chess, Deep Blue, and playing chess uh, against the world's greatest players and win it, winning, but now IBM Watson is also being used um, for medical um, and artificial intelligence. This also means that what is old will become new again. And what do I mean by that? Uh, back in the day, um, you know, can, uh, doctors made house calls. And what we saw over the 80s was, um, 80s and the 90s, and perhaps even in the 70s, was this big move towards building bigger and better hospitals, and that patients had to come into the hospital if they want to be seen, even for a simple doctor's visit. Um, doctors don't make so many house calls anymore. But we're seeing a return again to that as telemedicine is growing, and areas of the world or areas of the country that have um, smaller, more rural populations need to have uh, telemedicine or visiting nurses. Um, and so what we might see is that technology gets used in this realm as well. So in the example on the left there, you see a uh, nurse using a Microsoft HoloLens to take a look at a wound. And on the other side of that can be a doctor who's able to um, interact with the patient and with the nurse and perhaps even perform some diagnostics through the HoloLens. On the right side there, you see a character from the Star movie Star Trek, and this is a, um, or from one of the series of Star Trek, and this is a holodeck uh, doctor. Not so far-fetched these days. You might actually see something like that occur in the next uh, 10 or so years. 
Um, why is all of this important? It's important because as a health profession, as a profession, we need to be practicing more airline maintenance, maintenance in healthcare rather than automobile maintenance. And what do I mean by that? Well, an automobile breaks down and then we fix it. But with airline maintenance, we perform the maintenance, fix whatever might break before it becomes a problem. So it's a difference in a philosophic uh, thought process of, of how we approach healthcare. Because right now what we have the, as the automobile um, type of care, system of care, where we don't fix things until they're broken. Car maintenance versus um, airplane maintenance, which one will give you smoother sailing? The other thing that we need to do is that we can train and educate just like other high-risk, high-reliability industries do. And so two of those industries um, is, are the military air force uh, and the aviation industry and, the, and uh, military ground forces. Both of those have already adopted um, virtual reality and augmented reality for training purposes. So it's going to become commonplace in the next uh, five to 10 years for you to see doctors, nurses, other medical professionals using VR headsets to perform training. Um, or they could even do it if they go home um, and can't um, be in the hospital environment because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Just think about it, that you could still provide training that is very realistic hands-on tra training by sending a person home with a virtual reality headset. Um, artificial intelligence and voice response are coming along. We've actually implemented that in our model at Smartly. So you can actually, in the VR environment, engage in conversation with the patient just as you would uh, a real life patient. Susan. I don't think this video might not play here. But there is an example of that here where the person um, in my left arm. doing the recording is asking the patient a question. Practice of CPR and ACLS. Imagine that you could just put on a headset at home for your, um, for your, for your competency for um, CPR or for ACLS. And you wouldn't have to necessarily find your way into a testing center. It could be done with an instructor who is not even in the same uh, country as you, if, if not, you know, if necessary, or certainly not in the same room with you, but that, that instructor could just simply tune into different headsets at different locations and um, witness people being able to pour, perform CPR and sign them off. Administering medications can be practiced through um, virtual reality, all kinds of interactive things, almost everything that you could imagine that you do in the real life um, is becoming a reality in a uh, virtual reality. So I want to conclude there. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm the, I promise you the only uh, Kim Vergatini that there is. So you won't um, on LinkedIn. So you won't you won't find anyone else if you reach out to me. And I'd be happy to answer any questions after the talk or even during the talk now. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. I couldn't make that out. Yes, yes please, please continue. Did someone have a question? No, no, please continue, please continue. Okay, well, that was that was that was my talk. So, um, if anybody d does anyone have questions? If if not, then you can. If you think of something later, um, you can you can write to me. One. Good evening, everyone. I'm Aisha Abdul Adur Haruna a health economics freelance proofreader and digital marketer who works remotely in Kanu, Nigeria. 
I'm here to present a topic on the insights and innovations in public health. Innovations continue to be critical to tackle diseases without known cure and to help increase uptake and adherence to interventions that work. The McKinsey Global Institute identified 10 promising innovations now in progress that could have a material impact on healthcare by 2040. That is the next two decades, hopefully. We determine the impact of these innovations by interviewing experts and evaluating the biological understanding of each disease, as well as the efforts and excitement surrounding the new techniques and technologies that address the greatest unmet needs. The innovations we have identified here are more digitally enabled than those of the past. For example, there is a new app developed to help the neonatal intensive care unit families through stressful situation of having premature babies. And the app can be downloaded on Android phones and iPhones with the aim of using it worldwide. The app name is Integrated Family Delivered Neonatal Care App, IFCD for short. Going forward, the 10 promising interventions and innovations identified by my case, Global Institute of Health includes, one, we have the omics and molecular technologies. Some omics and molecular technologies engineer into our cellular components and analyze them. We have examples like the new tree genomics, which is a combination of transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. These are analytical methods used in determining the metabolic effect and ingredients in food, which will design the nutritional program for sustaining health development and status. So also in preventing diseases. Our mixed approach may be considered in order to reach the possible interactions between dietary components and energy balance. Another example of omics and molecular technologies is the CRISPR carbon malaria. Current treatments include the anti malaria prophylactics and non pharmaceutical measures such as the in your residual spray, especially in the evening. The insecticide treated bed netting. Another example of omics and molecular technologies is the CRISPR and carbon malaria. The current malaria and the malaria treatment include the prophylactics and non-pharmaceutical measures such as the indoor residual spray, such as the insecticide treated bed netting, the atimeter injections, which may significantly reduce reduced levels, especially in the for the maternal child and childhood care development. So also reduce disease levels by propagating the modified genes across the mosquito population. The next we have is the next generation pharmaceuticals. There are newer iterations of traditional chemical compounds and classes of molecules which could be used as medicinal drugs, possibly with premature and concurrent target structures. Examples, we have the sodium zirconium silicates, which are available as powders and can be mixed in water and administered orally to treat hyper Calamia. This results in lower, lower level potassium levels. 
it can be dissolved in water to treat lower serum potassium levels lev rapidly after an hour of ingestion in the gastrointestinal tract. We also have the protax. The protax are two-headed small molecules connected by a linker. They have the potential to produce long-lasting biological effects. Another example is the signalistics and regulation of cellular aging. Cellular aging is considered to be an unavoidable psychological process, but senolytics is a class of small molecules which may decrease or eliminate the aging cells that can cause cellular inflammation, dysfunction, and tissue damage. We also have cellular therapy and regenerative medicine. Cellular therapy being a biological product derived from living cells is for therapeutic purpose to repair or replace damaged tissues or cells. Regenerative medicine, on the other hand, has the power to restore diseased or injured tissues or organs. We have the hematopoietic stem cells, HPS, or the hematopoietic progenitor cells, HPS. These are also called the bone marrow transplant cells. It's the most frequently used cell therapy to treat variety of blood cancers and hematologic conditions. They are also used in treatment of many malignant diseases like the leukemia, lymphoma, so also in treatment of non-malignant diseases like the sickle cell disease. To replace or rebuild a patient's hematopoietic system. We also have the CARP cell therapy, which can be used in the treatment of the patient T cells, that is the immune cells, to target two more cells. When infused into the patient, the T cells bind into an antigen on two more cells, attacking and destroying them. We have innovative vaccines. Vaccines have historically eradicated or controlled the spread of infectious diseases around the world. And in future, these vaccines may target non-communicable diseases such as cancer. We have recombinant DNA techniques, which involves a production of potential new hepatitis B vaccine. The DNA sequence coding for hepatitis surface antigen is incorporated into yeast and activated to synthesize antigen, which is then purified. All these recombinant DNA vaccines offer promise of effective products that are less reactive and less expensive. Another example of innovative vaccine is the anti-idiotype antibodies, which are directed against the antibody to the hepatitis antigen. This may induce protection against hepatitis. We also have the mRNA vaccines and the DNA vaccines, which have potential to tackle diseases that have been previously had to vaccinate and can be more easily manufactured than the traditional vaccines. We have the AT4C vaccines and lowering of cholesterol. These are made up of molecules that bind to blood cholesterol and degrade it. This vaccine can only be required once a year. 
the next on my list is the advanced surgical procedures. It involves treating injuries and disorders with minimally invasive incisions or small instruments like the robotic surgery. As with many aspects of our lives, computers have also extended the practice of medicine into telemedicine. Very soon surgeons will be able to operate the patients remotely via live webcasts. Virtual hospitals or virtual wards are being operated everywhere from Australia, United Kingdom, and the Middle East. Another example of advanced surgical procedures is half of the cardiac valve surgeries are now catheter based. We have the suspended animation for severe trauma patients. This involves injecting a normal saline into the cold solution on first contact with the patient's cold body for like 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. So as to stop normal functions, this will give the surgeon time to operate before resuscitating the patient. The next promising intervention and innovation identified by McKinsey Global Institute of Health include the connected and cognitive device. These are portable, wearable, implantable devices which can monitor health and fitness information, engage patients and the communities of caregivers to deliver self-regulated therapies autonomously. We have the wearable by sensors, which are small and lightweight, one on the body to monitor vital signs, such as the temperature, heart rate, breather rate, and hence providing professionals with critical insights into progression or early onset of an illness. Like the device manufactured by Philips Electronics Company, BX100. It is designed to monitor COVID-19 patients in the hospital and detect signs of early deterioration. This device, the BX100, was first installed in Netherlands, where it has been used to remotely monitor patients in isolation rooms who are diagnosed or suspected of COVID-19 but don't need ventilation. We also have the smart thermometers connected in Helens, smart watch monitoring, and the e-tattoos for heart diagnostics, like the ultratin e-tattoos, which can monitor hearts for a longer period. And patients are more comfortable wearing it, thus providing wider range of data to enhance clinical decision making. Electroceticals is the next on my list. These are therapists that map neural circuitry organs administered by an implantable device delivered to specific targets. There are electrodes for biological interfaces. 
This is an interaction that exists in all implantable bioelectronic systems, exchanging electrical signal with human bodies, such as implants, restoring hearing for people who suffered from profound hearing loss or deep brain stimulation. Another example is the implantable microchips to mitigate chronic pains. This technique is now under development, stimulating the spinal cord, which can improve the patient's quality of life by increasing mobility, enhancing sleep, and reducing the need for pain medication. Now we go to robotics and prosthetics. Many of us are familiar with robotics and prosthetics since it's a wide variety of programmable self-controlled devices consisting of artificial substitutes or replacement for body parts, some of which are now under development. We have technological integration of artificial intelligence, the AI and machine learning in the prosthetic and orthotic industry. So also in the field of assistive technology, which has be become boon for persons with disabilities. We have the next generation exoskeletons. and the mobility support. The next generation exoskeletons powered by small monitors, which mimic human muscles, could allow older patients to recover autonomy, reducing the likelihoods of falls and accidents. We have the digital therapeutics, which are preventable therapeutic evidence-based interventions for a broad spectrum of physical, mental, and behavioral conditions controlled by software. Some of examples are mobile medical apps, like the IFCD I mentioned earlier, which is intended to treat specific medical conditions. We also have the neurologic music therapy to address motor. We have the speech and cognitive dysfunction caused by neurologic disease or, in the, or injury. We also have the intervention to, to train conclusion in patients. Digital delivery of education for chronic back pain patients. The sleep improvement program, the treatment of ADHD delivered through an engaging video game experience. Some of these apps are in the market while others are still under development. Also have the A1 powered app to change behavior. In the future, digital therapeutics powered by AI patient data and behavioral science can use gamification and other forms of engagement to help patients adopt and sustain to healthy behaviors. The last on my list is the tech 
enable care delivery. <clears throat> These are ways to deliver care to help care providers apply them to patients so as to improve the outcome, experience, and efficiency of healthcare. We have the COVID-9 one watch, which requires some queries to remote patients multiple times a day by text message. We also have creation of pregnancy watch based essentially on the clone of COVID watch system. There is a pen digital utility that has power of dealing with hundreds or even thousands of patients simultaneously, monitoring their input, responding to clinically relevant changes and triggering appropriate kinds of care responses. This system is tested for managing animals patient demand and anxiety like COVID epidemic. We have innovative multi-channel care delivery using an online platform, which may facilitate data sharing and make treatment more efficient. This is particularly relevant for chronic diseases such as diabetes. Example is the automated insulin delivery system, which monitors blood glucose levels of patients continuously, even while they are asleep. I'm thrilled to be part of this great team. Thank you everyone for listening. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for the valuable presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Apurva Barve. She is from University of California, USA. And she is going to give a presentation on a latent class analysis of psychosocial functioning and chronic diseases among Indian adults. And I request Dr. Apurva to start her presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you stop recording so I can share my slides? You can share the screen. So, um, just a minute. Oh, I told Shiva Prasad that um, my talk, because, because of the view that I am under. Um, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for arranging, conducting uh, such a good event. Thank you. Thank you for participating.